I'm running out of natural light to do this with. Uh, I have attempted this video three or four times, and this is meant to be part two of a three part series, and I rambled on like nobody's business, so I'm going to try very hard to make this a shorter version starting now, okay? So, in the last video, while I'm turning the camera around, in the last video I was talking about my current setup for uh, audiovisual stuff and how it works and what uh, the limitations are. Right now, um, that's still set up because, you know, I've not ripped the whole place apart yet. But I want to show you some other equipment that I've got. Now, I didn't really show you in much detail most of the equipment that you did see the, anyway. But this is the mixing desk. That's an analog mixing desk with a USB sound card connection. So basically it becomes four output channels and 16 input channels on USB. But when you do that, a lot of these controls um, don't do anything on, on the computer. So you don't have mixer controls as such. You've got an input and you can set the gain on that and that's about it. Um, and the output just comes out and obviously you can set the volume to, to, to listen. <coughs> but it doesn't give you actual controls. Um, there is a digital desk from Behringer that I really, really would like that does the, all of that. So it does all the sound stuff inside or you can use it for the computer or you can do both. So, mm. But this is not a control surface. This, this stuff here doesn't do anything on the computer when it, even when it's plugged into USB. But, uh, well, I think yeah, pretty much that. This equipment here, very very quickly I'll try and go through it because I spent too much time on this before. Top thing there is a patch bay. The idea is that loads of stuff, if I can get the picture in there I don't know, but loads of stuff is plugged in at the back, permanently plugged in. Uh, so instead of unplugging and plugging to connect one thing to another, like the effects unit to the microphone or whatever, you, you put it all through this. Um, so you'll see for example, there's the effects unit, this effects unit at the bottom, uh, which does reverb and special effects and all that sort of stuff. If I wanted to plug the computer into that, the, the analog audio from the computer, I can just plug two little short cables from there to there and that will speak to that. And then if I wanted the output from that to go to somewhere else, I can just click it, put, put it in there. At the moment, though, uh, the other thing you say about the patch bay is it also has little switches on the top that you've probably been, seen. Um, the little switches on the top tell it what to do when there's nothing plugged in, or when there's only one plugged in, or when there's both plugged in. Um, and, and it behaves different ways. For example, there is the game's PC analogue to channel 11 and 12 on the desk. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I don't plug anything to them, it automatically puts the sound from the computer, from the analogue sound in the computer, straight through to this channel on the mixer. Do, do, do. So I would control it with that. So if I'm listening to audio through the through the built-in sound card, not not digital, but through analog, then I can control it with this, do EQE things to it, send it to effects, all that sort of stuff there. Right. <coughs> um, uh, but if I plug cables in between, then that'll disconnect the two from each other and allow me to route them elsewhere. So that's that's the sort of version. It's like a like a old school um, telephone exchange. Connect one audio thing to another audio thing. That's a simple version. Let's leave it at that. This thing here, the black thing with the mysterious uh, red light and the socket. Basically, if I let you see that socket up close, uh, on the back of this uh, this device, this rack mount, is ten of those strips. Uh, ten of those connectors. Sorry, in a, in a strip. Bit like uh, you know. An, uh, power strip like that, except instead of standard UK plugs like I've got on those ones, it has those, oops, those, uh, which is the opposite end of uh, like a kettle lead, the kind of thing you plug into your USB, uh, to your computer's power supply, your PC power supply. So I have these cables that have the male to female of that, and they just plug, so everything goes through this, so do not touch that button <laughs> when it's running. <coughs> um, Two reasons for it. One is that it does, as you say, as, as I say, it connects ten things at once, a bit like these, you know, multi-way things that you use in the home. But it also has uh, suppression and uh, sorry, surge suppression and uh, filters out like noises on your electrical system, so that they don't go through to your audio equipment. It's meant for audio equipment more than computers, but it, it's you know, it works for both. So uh, it cleans up the, the sound, you don't get sort of weird hums off your, your mains electricity coming through when you plug things in through that. 
Right, uh, next, carry on with this quickly. This here, uh, the thing below it is, it, it's got a fancy name, but basically it's a compressor. Uh, and limiter. It's, it's what they call a dynamics processor, really, um, and it's a very subtle sound management thing. Um, it sets things like uh, like the, the bottom and top end of where sound would come in. So if you have, say, you have a, a very loud background uh, in in the room, so you want to record something that you can't plug into. So like a, a, an acoustic instrument, I don't know, a flute or a an acoustic guitar, whatever. A ukulele, you no know, one that doesn't have a plug in it, obviously. Um, then you can set so that the the sound doesn't trigger uh, through the system uh, until it reaches a certain volume. So while it, while it's quiet, you, you wouldn't get all the sort of in background noise. But while it's going anyway, and you you won't hear that. So while something loud's playing, it'll overpower it. So you can do things like that. That's a that's a gate. That's cool. Um, it also has a compressor which makes the sound. Um, not too loud, not too quiet, it kind of keeps it in the middle uh, and it's, it's a two-channel thing that's all I'm going to say about it, if you don't know what that stuff is you don't need to know, really <laughs> uh, if you want to know, it's compressor, limiter, expander gate uh, a peak limiter and a de <coughs> there you go <coughs> the thing below that, uh, the N1R is a Korg Korg? can you see that? yeah, Korg N1R is basically a Korg N1 Synthesizer without a keyboard. Um, the R stands for rack. Basically, it's the it's the brains and the control panel for a synthesizer. But instead of having its own keyboard that you can just like carry around and use right away, uh, it goes in a studio. So you plug in a, a MIDI keyboard that connects to it, uh, and it can also send signals out and signals back in. So in the back of that, you've got MIDI in and out and, and through, and you've also got analog audio outputs from it. Uh, I'll show you later on, well no I won't probably, <laughs> but basically you can connect that up or you can use the, the, the computer can send MIDI signals like uh, in the computer, the computer can store uh, a MIDI song uh, so that's not actually audio, it's just note information and it can play it back as well and that's 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 how MIDI works basically, it plays back note information rather than actual analogue sounds like a, no, there's no sample sound in it like a CD or an, uh, an audio file it's just done by you know telling it, press you know high C for X amount of time with X amount of pressure and, and so forth. Anyway, if you want to know about that, go and look it up. It's interesting stuff. Uh, if you're not interested in it, then I'm not going to go on about it anyway. MIDI also does other things, which I will come to later though. Uh, below that next is uh, Zoom RFX 2000. It's an old, uh, again, mo actually I was going to say most of these things, but all of these things I've picked up second hand uh, much later in their lives because I'm, I'm a poor person most of the time. And uh, this is no this is no different. I picked up this uh, effect unit cheap, well after the uh, you know its normal life, but it works fine. I actually had a, it did break down once, but that was my fault. I, I, I broke something in the power connector at the back. Got that fixed by a very nice person uh, locally, and boom, everything's brilliant. What this is is, is just as it sounds. Like an, it's an effects unit. It does reverb and delay uh, audio effects. You put sound in one place, it comes out the other. So like like I mentioned in the the, the patch bay. If you put a sound in there and then send it out there to a speaker or, or the, the mixing disc or whatever, in between there and there, <laughs> uh, it'll add these effects to it. So you get chorus, delay, uh, reverb. It's got specialist effects like rotary, where the sound's going from left to right and things like that. Um, it's got little all-in-one producer in a box type settings as well. They're okay. There's a reason my producers get paid properly though. Um, and it's all controllable. It's controllable through MIDI. I'll explain about that in a minute because MIDI isn't just musical notes. Uh, and also uh, it is, uh, it's all sort of controllable and program where you can store presets and everything. I don't really use that much. I might use it for the audio, uh, for the um, audiovisual stuff, but not very likely. I might do, never know, you never know, so never say never. Uh, more likely I'll use the computer to make any sort of effects that I want to make. Now, there's Zeus again, hello Zeus. Your paws are going to get run over if you don't move bud. That's it, thank you. So there's Zeus, that's my doggy Zeus. Hello Zeus, hello. Right, moving on. <coughs> You've seen all the hardware from the computer, the main computer, you know all about that from the last video. 
So now I'm going to move on to stuff that I want to use but don't use at the moment. Now there are, it's mostly just software reasons for that. Um, and that's because of MIDI stuff. Now I'll explain again. MIDI it stands for Musical Instrument, hang on, hang on, hang on, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry, don't care. Um, stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface and what it does as well as giving you the information about the, the notes, you know, the, the A, B, C on your, on your, you know, like you would get on a piano or a guitar or keyboard or whatever as well as giving you the note information and the, the lo how, long it, how long to hold it and all that sort of thing it can also send signals to tell you to change parameters so for example volume is obviously a very simple one to understand panning and things like that so you can use MIDI equipment sorry I've not got the thing flicked around so I can't see how close I am to that hope you can see me okay uh, so MIDI can use, be, be used to control a lot of things and you'll find there's actually a lot of things in the audiovisual world that use MIDI as their communication medium um, uh, which might not even have any sort of keyboard or, or, or you know, synthesizer type parts to them at all. Uh, literally you have things called control surfaces, which I'm going to show you, um, which exists and there's no, you know, there's no musical part to it at all. It's literally just for controlling parameters and you can program them to be, as I say, to build different parameters. Right, I'm going to flick you back around, so bear with me. I hope I was in shot for doing that, I just didn't want to flick the thing around just for that moment. Um, <coughs> the stuff that I'm not using, that I should be using, when I'm doing a stream, if I want to change scenes on OBS, which I showed you earlier, all the different uh, scenes, I have to use like a, a keyboard shortcut, so I have to hold down a key and then press another key, or whatever I've set it up to. This keyboard is quite noisy. Now, I love the keyboard, I'm not going to change to a mushy keyboard just for uh, just for the streaming. When I'm talking, when there's a game running and there's violence and all sorts going on, you don't really hear it anyway. But when I'm doing other stuff, like the nerdy show that I do, sometimes whilst somebody else is talking, I will be trying to type in something or edit something or check something on the internet. And rather than have to switch my mic off, actually no, that, that was a bad example because I will have to switch the mic off for that, I can ignore that one. Uh, but what, uh, yeah, while to control OBS while somebody else is talking without making a noise, uh, uh, I, I, I want to use MIDI. Now MIDI is not like a, it's not magic, it's not built in. You know, you don't plug these things in and they automatically, that connects, you know, that becomes an A key, B key, C key, D. No, it doesn't work like that. So you have to program them a bit. There are software out there that will translate MIDI signals from one type, you know, from one MIDI signal to another. So, um, you can do it, but I thought I was going to have to write something myself or, or fiddle about with stuff and then I discovered through Benny, uh, a good friend Benny, Benedict from Germany who's on the uh, Linux Gamers Group, that uh, there was a bit of software that does almost exactly what I want so I'm going to have a lot less hassle with it. Uh, if you haven't already, check out Benny's video, it's linked at the bottom of the last video, uh, part one of this, and uh, He's got a really good setup, and um, you know that was what inspired me to start looking at and changing around some of the things here and get more out of what I've got, because all this stuff is sitting there doing nothing if I don't use it. Now I used to have multiple PCs. When I moved flats, I, I didn't have much room. I was a bit of a hoarder. I had to get rid of stuff. There was all sorts of um, shenanigans reasons, but essentially I have only one desktop computer now. A lot of hardware actually was was old and not working. Um, I've only recently rebuilt the main computer with some new hardware as it is. Uh, so I had to get rid of a lot of stuff. So I only have the one main PC. At the moment, as, as you remember, I have the big screen and the little screen. I did at various times have small screens, two small screens set up, uh, one at either side and so forth. But it just gets really difficult to use. I end up hurting my neck by sort of craning around. and um, So really, when I'm not using the uh, OBS, the, the, the streaming software or anything, I just want this monitor in front of me, the big one, because almost everything is fine on that. Um, it, it's nice and big so that I can see it with my reasonably bad eyesight. And, uh, sorry, don't even hear that bird outside, that put me off there. Uh, and um, so it's a reasonably big monitor, it's 27 inch. Uh, 1080p monitor, so it's, you know, it's fine, it's not super high def or anything, but it's brilliant for me. Uh, so what I want to do, or what one of the possible plans is, uh, 
is to get rid of that mo that other monitor. Now the reason that I have the other monitor is when you're broadcasting on this screen, on the big screen, a game takes up the whole screen. Uh, it's not like a, a word processor or um, another program where it's like a window that you can move around and stuff. I mean, you, you sort of can, but that's not really the ideal way to play to play a game. A game ideally fills up the whole screen. So you cannot see chat. I can't see the um, the broadcasting software to see if it's if it's still working. If something's gone wrong, so therefore you know we come back to this. So when OBS, when I'm running a stream, OBS is on that screen. The open broadcast software is on that screen. And I got like indicators to tell me if it's connecting to the internet properly, if it's speaking to Twitch properly, um, if the video encoding that's going on is all working fine. So there's loads of things, and also I can see like a preview of what you guys see when I'm on. Uh, I showed you that part one. I'm not going to go on about that too much. So that screen when I'm broadcasting is where all that happens. I did have a third screen at that side for chat, but I decided that you know that was as I say my neck was getting sore. Like, craning around all over the place. Sorry, I just make you dizzy by doing that. Um, and I wanted to streamline it a bit. So I cut back to just the one monitor. And what I do is I actually put a, a little chat window in the top corner over uh, over the uh, the broadcast software if I really need to chat. But obviously when I'm broadcasting, I talk to the audience. I don't need to type to chat, so it doesn't matter. Uh, which is one of the reasons why it was, was better. I just needed to be able to see the chat to see so I could respond to it. Right. Rambling uh, for too long as it is, so I'm going to really try and wrap this up. Other equipment, just quickly to explain. Uh, this is just a preamp for a mic. Don't worry about that. In fact, pointless. No, no interest. This here is what I wanted to get to. This and the laptops. Now, this is a MIDI control surface. When I push a button on this, it sends a MIDI encoded signal to whatever it's connected to. And as you'll see though, this is not a keyboard like a you know piano style keyboard. It's literally just controls, sliders, uh, rotary controls, and some buttons. But the beauty of MIDI is you can assign those to be anything. So if I have a, a music studio program running on the computer, I can control the music channels like a mixer. Okay, so like a mixer from there so uh, on and that'll move the things on the computer screen so instead of having to sort of click very precisely with the mouse which can be quite difficult with a lot of those programs you can use an, a physical control to move the volumes up and down to pan the sound from left to right or whatever you need to do or to you know to set eq so that's that's like the tone controls and you can you know start and stop the recording or play back with the buttons so all that sort of stuff happens there now that's a cheap one not the best, not particularly reprogrammable. Um, even in Windows, it can be a bit of a pain to reprogram it uh, because it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's a bit older and I'm not sure there's a new modern driver for it or whatever. I don't use Windows, I use Linux, um, and I, as far as I know, there's no program for it. Now, there are ways around that, but the easiest thing to do is just take it as it comes, you know, use a program to sort of sniff what signals that are being sent through MIDI. And, um, sorry, the dog making a noise. What signals are being sent through MIDI and translate them to another MIDI signal. So the MIDI signal for that might be, you know, it's, it's just a numeric value usually. So it might be, um, you know, let's say it's MIDI signal 10, uh, 1. You know, it's all sort of segmented. Sorry, that's probably not making much sense. But let's just call this 10, 1. Um, 10 1 will be a number between 0 and 127. Okay, so that's what those that's that's what that'll be. That'll be 0, that'll be 127. Obviously you could set it the other way as well, but so um, say I wanted to control the volume on a, on the synthesizer with this, that signal 10 1, as a just an arbitrary number, don't worry about that. But that 10 1 and then the volume number that goes with it would have to be exactly what that synthesizer had set up for its volume control. And that's where it gets a bit more fiddly than um, than it should be. Because um, MIDI, although it's a standard and there's a lot of standard stuff in there, there's lots of bits of MIDI that, uh, sort of signal areas that were just left to different manufacturers. So, although a lot of stuff is quite standard and universal, a lot of it isn't either. Um, so, and the idea for, sorry, the idea for this, uh, I started talking about one thing and wandered off. The idea for this is, rather than clicking loud keys while I'm on stream, to switch those scenes I could just press one of those near silent rubber buttons. Uh, and you know, that would make things a lot easier. 
I don't have to look for the right key, I don't have to get past the microphone, I can have the microphone right in front of me, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I can just touch a button and boom, there we go. So that would make life easier for controlling the software. Now, we come from that little thing to this, <laughs> which as you can see does have a keyboard on it. Now this does not um, make any noise by itself. It has to be plugged into a computer or a synthesizer or another sound making bit of hardware or software. Um, so all it does is send MIDI note signals when you push these buttons, these piano keys. And then it's got lots of encoders. Now the reason I got this specific one is because it is completely programmable. It is wonderful. And when I say programmable, I don't mean that you have to go to the computer and do anything. Literally, on board the computer, uh, on board the, the keyboard controller itself, you can tell it which MIDI signal to send from every single button and slider and rotary control. Also, they're very, very nice controls. All rubberized, uh, these controls, they're all, they feel really nice. They're very precise. It's a great, great controller. It has a lot of sort of utility buttons that aren't marked for anything in particular. They're just marked F1 to F16, like a function here in the computer. Uh, but some of them do have specific markings, but you can, you know, you can ignore these markings. But there, there's a play, record, stop, back and forward. Uh, these four things here are drum pads. Uh, these are a bit like the MIDI uh, note keys. In fact, they are MIDI note uh, inputs normally. You can re-assign uh, them to anything, but by default they send the right uh, number for a MIDI drum note. That's what they do by default. So that would be like a, one of them, I can't remember which way around it is, but I think that's the bass drum and that's the cymbal or something. But also these are like a, a keyboard key. They have a, an analog number from 0 to 127. So if you hit them quite hard, you get a louder noise from your drum program or your drum synth or whatever. Anyway, this, although it is big, as you can see I have to step back to actually put it in the frame. Although it's big because of this, the keyboard size, um, it was one of the best and one of the most programmable ones. For me as a Linux user, I didn't have to worry about some specialist software from a manufacturer that would only work on Windows and maybe Mac to be able to do what I want with it. It does everything on board. Um, there are programs for it, I think, as well. I've never really looked. But there are programs to make it easy, in inverted commas, for people. But um, this does everything on board. You just push a button to change it to programming mode, select a, a control that you want to change, and then tell it what MIDI signal, you know, using numeric data to, to, to send out. Boom, does it. You can store presets. You can switch between, I think it's 32 presets. So I can have it set up. I could literally program it to be exactly what my synthesizer uh, understands, all the numbers, all the codes it understands, and just switch to another one, and it would be all the codes that my uh, recording software understands. So suddenly I can then control the audio channels and the software with these, the, the EQ and the panning with these, and so forth. Right, so it is big, but the, but the controls are awesome. And uh, I was looking for a, a MIDI controller, which you do get them, where, where this has all these buttons at this side, you do get them in a sort of just a controller formation, like a bigger version of that. But they're quite pricey, and not necessarily as, as programmable as I would like. And I also at the time was looking for a new keyboard, because um, I only had like a little 32 key one. No, it wasn't, it was a 25 key one, sorry. Which was just two octaves. I wanted something a little bit bigger, a little bit more playable. I'm not much of a player, but just I wanted something that I could use uh, for actual playing and uh, and a controller. And, and for the money that I had, the budget I was on at the time, this was the perfect answer. It's so good. Uh, I cannot I cannot say <laughs> you know I cannot under undersell this thing. It's a, made by Samson, the people who make. Uh, you probably have Samson microphones and such like, and some other uh, audio equipment. It was made by them as their sort of attempt at this market. Um, I don't know how much they're pursuing it because I've not really seen much, you know, they, had, they don't seem to have made a bigger one of this model and what have you. And for the price they were selling it, I'm not really sure how they could because the quality is excellent. It's, it's just so good. Anyway, that's ramble, ramble, stop the rambling, Hamish, get on with this. The other thing I mentioned earlier, so yeah, uh, again, in theory, this could be used to switch my scenes on OBS, to adjust the volume for different people in a, in a chat, all sorts of things. Anything I've got physical control over, I can use this to control it. 
or anything I've got computer control over, I can use this to physically control it. Now, you'll see this laptop there. This is my normal laptop. This is my Frankenstein laptop. A few years ago, I used to have a computer shop, and uh, this is built from lots and lots of spare parts. And I eventually got a working laptop out of all that. I think I might have had to buy a screen for it. But everything else was like bodged together from uh, other parts. I'm really pleased with myself because laptops are not really modular like PCs are. <laughs> this laptop is running KX Studio. It's not switched on at the moment. KX Studio is a Linux distro based on a slightly older Ubuntu but with uh, audio visual tools ready to run out of the box. It's an exceptionally good uh, audio tool. I have tried Ubuntu Studio and several others that I can't even remember the names of anymore. KX Studio is the best one of them all. I'm not sure about its future. Again, it runs on a slightly older Ubuntu, and I didn't think I didn't notice them updating it when the when the long-term version of Ubuntu updated. So I'm a bit worried about that. But they also make all the tools that make it good are made by the same people, and they're constantly updated. So um, you know, even if the distro itself goes, all the tools that make it good are, are, are available. And in fact, I do run lots of the tools on there. You saw a couple of them earlier in the first video. Lots of those tools run on my Arch setup anyway. So as I say, the tools are perfectly, you know, they're open source, they're perfectly uh, available. But this KX Studio just puts everything together for you, it just works, it's so good. Um, if I have to make a bit more effort, I would rather keep those tools than, than keep an old version of KX Studio, if that's how I have to go. So it might get Arch on it at some point, uh, I don't know, we'll see, we'll see. So, second computer essentially, that laptop, because I don't use it that much as a laptop. I use it sometimes for uh, studio stuff. Uh, it's got audio, as I say, it's got KX Studio on it, so I've used it for uh, using a program called Arder, which is a multi-track recorder. Um, especially, it's really good with something like this. Not the mixing desk itself, but the USB part of the mixing desk gives you these 16 inputs and 4 outputs. Um, you can have it on surround, you can have it for two different sets of speakers, all sorts of things. Uh, so you can use it uh, as a multi-track recorder, uh, and I have. I mean, I've used the mixing desk and that as a multi-track recorder. Or, you know, I've used it as a portable device, um, you know, as, as a laptop as such. With, like, this thing, because this thing's, I don't know if you can see the size of it, but it's very small. It basically, you know, it fits in the laptop case and you can do editing and stuff on it without having to have everything open. But I'm a blind old bugger, so these days I need it all on a huge screen. <laughs> Excuse me. So I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to be using any of that stuff on it. Right, last bit of hardware and then I'll explain the plan. This is another laptop, this is a broken one again that I got fixed, um, or that I fixed rather. I think I had to, might have had to replace the screen on this one as well. And I certainly had to replace some other parts of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh dear. Excuse me. So essentially, I have another. No, this one is bigger than that one. You can see. You can see right away. This is a 17-inch uh, display. That's only a 15-inch. This has got bigger speakers in it. Um, it's a better laptop for almost everything except the actual raw power of it. Uh, the uh, small laptop has a much faster processor, more RAM. Although I think the RAM's the same on them, so I could conceivably swap it over. But um, the bottom line is that this that's more powerful, but this has got a bigger screen. Uh, the reason I use that is essentially the power compared to that one. But it's not bad, I mean, it's not that... I think it's like a 1.5 gigahertz core, dual core, or something to that effect. In fact, it might say on it. Let's have a look. Toshiba, by the way, don't buy Toshiba the shit. But... Um, if you're, if you're building it for parts for yourself, then you know, go for it. No, it doesn't say. It just says T2080, which I think is an Intel processor. Now, at the moment, that's not even got anything installed on it. <coughs> but it will have either Arch or KX Studio installed to it soon. Now, back to my ugly mug. If there's still light. And before the dog gets f explodes from excitement from uh, me moving around. He thinks he's missing something because I'm talking and uh, not to him. Okay, so here's the plan. This video has turned out as long, as, uh, long again, but hopefully it's entertaining to watch me bumble or something. Point is, all those bits of equipment, as in the laptop, the keyboard uh, with the controller on it, the controller surface, and a lot of the audio equipment is, is going unused. 
to route audio around on Linux, there is brilliant software for it. Uh, and it works perfectly well with all my hardware. The problem I have is that because I'm streaming games and using chat programs like uh, Discord, they don't really know Jack. <laughs> there we go. They don't work with Jack. They're not what they call a Jack aware uh, program. So all the sound, as I mentioned in the first video, basically the sound from the games, the chat, and everything just gets pumped into one stereo in, one stereo out. Um, so you don't have control over it. You do have control over individual volumes for the programs or whatever, but you can't tell it to send the program, uh, the volume, the audio from the game to somewhere else and the audio from the chat to somewhere else and then switch between them, like on OBS for example. So there's a lot of control not there. And also the big problem that I said earlier in the, the first video is that when I am running, uh, not the game streams, but when I'm doing the nerdy chat show thing that we do, it's very hard for me to get audio from my end, other than the microphone, back to them. Uh, the reason is the program that's telling it, it's Discord we use for the chat, and it's, it's telling them to send the microphone chat, microphone uh, sound back, but not the system sound. I can do that with the jack thing that I showed you, you know, the sort of the virtual patch bay. I can plug it all in, but the problem there, we would end up with a big feedback loop. Sorry, my, my, my expressive hand is not on video. We end up with a big feedback loop and all sorts of weird problems. So it's very difficult. I can get rid of Pulse Audio from the system, um, but that makes it very difficult. A lot of programs now expect Pulse Audio to be there. They rely on it. They shouldn't. <laughs> um, and I know that most things will work without it, but it's, it's a hassle. The way, it's, the way that things come out, out of the box, if you like, for the software, they're not really happy unless Pulse Audio is there. Uh, Pulse Audio is a bit like Jack, it's just like an over the top mixing program that you know root, roots to uh, different audio things in your computer. So that you can mix sound from a game and sound from your music player or whatever at the same time and hear it all together. Unfortunately it's not as controllable or configurable as Jack, at least not on the surface of it. I mean I'm sure it is internally. Um, I'd be... Sorry, the dog's growling at something. It's probably a cat. I can't see what it is, but he's growling at something. Anyway, shush, shush, shush. Uh, the uh, I'm not going to edit this, so sorry. <laughs> You're going to have to do extra ten minutes of crap in between. Uh, there, uh, if Pulse Audio gave me full control over my audio, full.